Shalom Chavrim, I'm Stephen Benun. You're watching Israeli News Live. Tonight is a special broadcast. It is a prophetic broadcast of Israeli News Live. It is from Danun Institute of Biblical Research, our research side of our, our ministry, which I do want to thank you, those of you that are, that are supporting this work. We really want to take the time to thank you for your kindness and your love. If God's laying it on your heart to be a part of this ministry, you're more than welcome and greatly appreciated if you want to be a part. You can donate by either going to israelinewslive.org, place there you can click to donate, or israelreturns.com. Our address will appear at the end of this video as well as it's on israelreturns.com. Uh, anyway, thank you. If you've emailed me here in the past few weeks and I've not responded to you guys, I've got about a thousand emails in my inbox. I get way behind because I spent a lot of time studying, research, prayer, and I, I don't mean to put anything on the back burner, but sometimes there's things that I feel in my heart that need to be gotten out. This message is one of those messages, and I think you're going to see why when you, as we go into it. Horses, a revelation in their rider. To save time, it is a lengthy message. Rather than reading the entire scripture from Revelation, we're going to be going to it step by step as we go, so we'll just go right into the message right now. All right, let's take a look at this here. I want to start off here in Daniel, the king of the north. And the reason why I'm bringing this up is because it's a big issue and it has everything to do with the horse riders of Revelation. Okay, and you're going to see that as we go through. But it helps to establish who the king of the north really is. Now, there are some that say, well, north, northern and southern kingdoms of Israel are what make up who the king of the south and the king of the north is. The, king, the house of Judah, the house of Israel. There is some truth into that. I had a friend of mine, she sent this to me, and I do agree in principle that there's a lot of truth in there, because why? The, the house of Israel is still scattered abroad. She's in every nation. And so when it comes to the United Nations forces and those troops from around the world, that is made up of many people from the house of Israel. But when it comes to who's the king of the house of Israel, well, they have elected the Pope of Rome to rule those nations. And he is the head of it all. He is also Esau's own king. So there's a little difference in there. But it does clear up a little bit when it comes to the house of Judah, the king of the south, pushing at the king of the north. And we always find that with Judah with <laughs> none other than who we find as Prime Minister Netanyahu as being the king of Israel. He was anointed as a king by uh, uh, years ago by uh, Mike, uh, I forget Mike's last name, but Mike, he actually anointed him to be king of Israel. And he becomes, and he said he would be king not once, but twice over Israel. So very interesting thoughts when we look at this. Let's take a look real quick at the scripture. Neither shall he regard the God of his fathers, nor the desire of women, nor regard any God, for he shall magnify himself above all. And the Pope of Rome considers himself the vicar of Christ, which is a substitute for Jesus Christ himself. He's above everything on the earth as far as, he, as he's concerned and as far as most of the majority of the world is concerned, right? Now, but in his estate shall he honor the God of forces. And friends, many times I thought this just being God himself, but as I look at it in the Hebrew language sitting right here beside me here, it could very easily really be that he honors a demonic God for the military might to bring in subjection what he wants. And with that, let's go to the horse riders. The white horse rider, the scripture says in Revelation chapter 6 verse 2, And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Now, when I tell you about this white horse rider, let me tell you one thing about this and about the other three horses that are coming afterwards. I can still see the white horse rider still on his ride. But there are certain things in his history Historically speaking, in fact, there's two things that show the clear distinction of who this writer is. It is the papacy, but there are certain things that have happened in history that also lets us know how that it, it directly is related to the papacy. 
Now we can go all the way back to the beginning of the Catholic Church in 325 during the Nicaea Council under Constantine, when, and by the way, outside uh, St. Peter's Basilica in Vatican City, there, there is a horse on either side. There are riders on both of those horses. One rider has a crown, which is Constantine, where he united church and state together. And he went forth riding. But the interesting thing is, is according to the scripture, he is given a crown. So he doesn't have a crown as of yet. And I said, the papacy is really the one who rides the horse there. So in the beginning, when the papacy starts off and they're riding on their horse, as they've come down, what did they do in the beginning, back there in the times of Constantine? They went through, they murdered and killed anybody that didn't agree with them and burnt all their books to go with it. All the believers, the Christians of Northern Africa, they were killing and burning them. No wonder why in recent times they have discovered ancient writings of even Mary Magdalene that were buried in Egypt, of all places. They had to bury it because they were being murdered and persecuted for believing anything outside Constantine's edict of what would be known as the Bible of that time. Now, this doesn't mean that the Bible that we got was a bad Bible. It's made up from books and writings of that time period as well. The thing is, is why didn't they allow the other writings that were being suppressed? Interesting, isn't it? So as we move forward, though, even after Constantine, and, the, and it comes up, before the, the split, where we end up with an Eastern Orthodox and a Roman Catholic Church, the Western uh, Orthodox religion, we had a very interesting man that comes along. He also is featured in front of St. Peter's Basilica on a white horse with no crown on his head. In fact, the very story about Charlemagne makes you think, of the very passage. And I saw and behold a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow. In other words, he's a warrior. And a crown was given unto him. See, the crown is given to him. Charlemagne continued his father's policies towards the papacy and became its protector. See, there's his warrior-like character. Removing the Lombards from the power of northern Italy and leading an incursion into Muslim Spain, he also campaigned against the Saxons to his, to his east, Christianizing them upon penalty of death. Well, convert or die. That's one of the things I don't think Eastern Christianity really cared about. Anyway, leading to the events such as the Massacre of Verdun when he was crowned emperor of the Romans by Pope Leo III. So who's the guy in control of this horse? Leo III. All right, but what is he? He's crowned emperor of the Romans. See, he does the battling, but he has no crown. He's given a crown, and it's the Pope of Rome that gives him his crown. Remember, he honors the God of forces. Hmm. So... On Christmas Day at Old St. Peter's Basilica is where this happened. A little bit more of the history behind this. So Charlemagne was, has been called the father of Europe. And he has united most of Western Europe for the first time since the Roman Empire. His rule spurred the uh, Carol Carolingian Renaissance, a period of energetic cultural and intellectual activity within the Western Church. All holy Roman emperors up to the first uh, excuse me, up to the last, Emperor Francis II, as well as both the French and German monarchies, considered their kingdoms to be descendants of the Charlemagne Empire. However, the Eastern Orthodox Church views Charlemagne more controversially. Sure they would. Now, it doesn't stop there. Remember I said he was given a crown. We also find the same inside the Catholic Church itself. 1095, Pope Urban II launches the first crusade. Again, another thing showing the white horse and their riders. What did they do? They wore the white shirts with the red crosses on there. And it is during after 10, uh, 1054 when they had the split between the Eastern, Eastern Orthodox believers and the Western Roman Catholics. There was a major split. And when that split took place, guess what they did? they crowned their first pope of Rome. 
Because remember, the main reason for the split was the Eastern Orthodox felt like that you didn't have to have a supreme universal leader. And the Roman Catholics wanted to be world leaders. So sound familiar about what's happening today? Think about a new world order. Think about the one world government. Think about all these things, guys. What do you think they're fighting for now? Why do you think the battles are going on in Ukraine? Well, you'll find out about that in just a moment as we look at the second horse and his rider as well. This is what's still happening today, guys. It's, it's not changed. The papacy still honors the God of forces. And that white horse is still riding, in my opinion, in the name of religion, stomping out anything that doesn't agree with him. You don't believe it? You ask John Hagee. Why did John Hagee, the man that told the truth about the Catholic Church that really preached hard from his heart, had a mighty uh, ministry inside of Israel, why did he do the sudden change? Why did John Hagee suddenly say that he was wrong about the papacy? Why did he say all of this? Because either you join with them or they take you out. Kenneth Copeland, all the rest of them, all these mainstream religions going back and joining the mother church, you either join it or you go to war. This is what happened in Russia. For most of you, you may not know this, but Russia for more than 200 years of her history was a Christian nation. The Eastern Orthodox had gone that way. Why? Because as they, they first they went to Constantinople. Okay, in Constantinople, they were overthrown. Why? Because the Catholic Church used the Ottoman Empire and overthrew them. And when they had to leave there, they went to Moscow, settled there. That became known as their Third Rome. Because why? They were still part of the Roman Church originally, so they called it the Third Rome. But they were the Eastern Orthodox, later became known as Russian Orthodox. But you still have all kinds of Eastern Orthodox. You have the Coptic Christians. By the way, most Christians that are killed in the Middle East are not Roman Catholic. They're Eastern Orthodox Christians. Why do you think the Pope doesn't say much about it? It's not his own. The whole thing about this war all through the Middle East, all through the different places, and as well in Ukraine, is to kill and stomp out those Eastern Orthodox because they have refused to come home to Catholic Mother Church. And by the way, she didn't give birth to them. Her daughters have been coming home. The Baptists, the Methodists, the Pentecostals, the Presbyterians, they all came home. Even the Muslims came home. That's their children. But you have to remember the Eastern Orthodox Church is not a child of Rome. They're only a split off. They're brother sister. And she's going to stomp out anybody that doesn't agree with her. Let's take a look at the red horse here. Revelation 6, 4. And there went out another horse that was red. And power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. All right? A great sword. Now, the horse pictured on your screen there happens to be called a don, a Russian don. It is a native horse of Russia that just so happens to be red. But here's what's interesting. Why do we get this red horse? And where is it scripturally speaking in time? It happens to be from the Bolshevik Revolution or the Red Army or Red October. The revolution that took place at Lenin, Vladimir Lenin, the so-called atheistic revolutionist that overthrew the Tsars of Russia, who was backed by trained in Geneva, Switzerland, backed by the Federal Reserve. The Federal Reserve gave them money in order to create the revolution in Russia. Why do you think Putin is so quick to stomp out anybody that tries to raise up, and yet the Western media tries to portray him as, oh, he wants to bring back communism. He wants to bring back that atheistic belief. And people send me emails. Oh, he's, he's banning all the religions. No, you know what he's doing? He knows that the, that, that the Roman Catholic Church is trying to overtake his country once again. And yet this man is professing to believe in Jesus Christ. I believe he does. And I will say, God bless Vladimir Putin. 
God blessed this man. You know why? Because he recognizes all the Jesuits that have infiltrated his country through the history of it, through the history of Russia, even up to the time of, of Vladimir Lenin, Joseph Stalin. I don't know if he knows about them very well, but they were Jesuits, Jesuit trained come into the country to overthrow the country. What for? The Roman Catholic Church wanted to stomp out the Eastern Orthodox religion. They had been waging war since the time of their split to try to stop them because they didn't agree with them and they didn't agree with the universal power of the Pope who on his flag has the two keys showing that he has all spiritual and political powers. How can they have another church dominating the other part of the world when they claim to be the only one that is the dominant power of the world? So they brought it in. They brought in communism. What was the first thing they did? They went in there through their communistic belief, the atheistic ideology, and they began to stomp out every single Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox faith there was in the country. They imprisoned all of their people. What was it? The red horse rider was running. The red army. Red October. This is why it gets the name red from. But it goes even further. It goes outside the borders of Russia and goes into red China. Why do you think they have their red flags with the sickles and the hammer? This was, the, this was nothing but Jesuit-inspired people to overthrow all these countries that had Eastern Orthodox believers that were thriving. Do you know that Russia had evangelized the country of China? Unbelievably so. And the Catholic Church kept trying to overthrow them, and they couldn't do it from within, so what did they do? They started a revolution and took it and brought in communism, brought in atheistic belief. What do you think they're doing in the United States for? This is nothing but Jesuits in the United States overthrowing the United States from within. Why do you think Bernie Sanders, the socialist guy, gets up there and the Pope likes him? Because socialism breeds communism. By the way, after they got rid of all, at least they thought they got rid of all the Russian Orthodox and Eastern Orthodox believers inside of Russia. And they changed the calendar. You know, they used a Julian calendar. And I don't say the Julian calendar is some perfect calendar because in Qumran, they used a totally different calendar than any of them did. But they used a Julian calendar. The Russians did. They never would adopt the Gregorian calendar. But guess what? Vladimir Lenin made them change to a Gregorian calendar. You don't think the man wasn't a Jesuit? Hello, somebody better wake up. Do a little research on it. You'll find out he was a Jesuit. And even though it was an atheistic country, guess which religion was allowed to become the state religion and accepted in any parts of Russia and the Soviet Union? You got it. The Roman Catholic Church. You don't believe it? Ask my wife. When she had been accepted at med school and then she was turned down to be a medical doctor in her country because she was not a Roman Catholic, the Catholic priest comes to her house in front of her mother and her father, and her father has told me the story as well, said, if you want to be able to join, renounce your religion in Jesus the way you believe it, and you come and embrace the Catholic Church and we will get you in the school because we have the political power to do so. You can find out many more stories like that. So yes, the red horse rider was communism. It was the papacy through the Jesuits that were riding the red horse using communism as well as in China, freedom of religion in China. Check it out. I brought this from Wikipedia, but I've already done all the research and other documentations. So Wikipedia is not my sole source. It is only what I can do is condense the source for you a little bit to make it simpler for you guys. Freedom of religion in China is provided for by the country's constitution. Watch this here. Remember now, according to historical documentation, it was the Eastern Orthodox Church that prevailed in China until communism. And there, the early fathers, founders of China were, called, were said to be the students of Lenin and Stalin. But guess what they did have, though? They had the Catholic Church. Pro provided for by the country's constitution with an, with an important uh, uh, caveat, the government protects what it calls normal religious activities, defined and practiced as activities that take place within the government-sanctioned religious organizations as registered places of worship. 
Human rights bodies have criticized this def, uh, differentiation as falling short of international standard of protection of religious freedom. China's five official sanctin, sanctioned religious organizations are the Buddhist Association of China, Chinese Taoist Association, Islamic Association of China, Three Self Patriotic Movement, and Chinese Patriotic Catholic Association. The only Christian organization. Roman Catholic, nothing else. Muslims can, can be there, sure. They're faithful warriors for the Mother Church. Interesting, isn't it? That was your red horse rider. He's still, on, he's still at work, still doing his biting. Oh, they make it look like a big to-do, you know, human rights violations and all this type of stuff. Don't worry. Pope talks, works, tries to work out things. You know what the Pope's doing? He's making sure that they have full dominance. And I'll tell you why. Because after the collapse of the Soviet Union, which was done by what? Pope John Paul II. How come Pope John Paul II and Ronald Reagan could bring about the collapse of the Soviet Union with basically with not even a bullet being fired? How could you cause the largest empire to suddenly change without hardly firing a bullet? That's because the Catholic Church deemed it was time. And when they did, they thought they had done away with the Orthodox religion. And out of 7,000 churches that, were, that existed in the Soviet Union, 4,000 of those Orthodox, Russian Orthodox, Eastern Orthodox churches were in Ukraine. No wonder why Ukraine is the major conflict for today. Too many Russian believers. You know, recently I looked at an RT documentary. It was RT hosted the documentary, but it's done by a California boy. California man. I don't want to call him a boy, but uh, uh, a young man from California did a documentary on Crimea. Went for himself to see what the true origins of Crimea was, only to find out there was no Russian army forcing people to do anything. And at one point in the documentary, the people all hold up their Russian passports and said, we're Russian citizens to begin with. We were born in Russia. Over and over and over, Crimea is part of Russia, but yet the whole world tries to make it look like it's part of Ukraine. No, Ukraine was given administrative delegation. Some say that during the Soviet Union that it was given to Ukraine as a gift. Russia just doesn't give away gifts. The papacy made sure that it was given to Ukraine as a gift so that they would make sure they had it when they brought, when they put, brought the close of that error. But Sien's, uh, the last prime minister of Ukraine was pro-Russian. This is where the problem comes in. Don't have time to get into that. We'll save that for another broadcast. Anyway, let's continue on with the riders here, of the horses here. Now we're going to the black horse rider. It's going to be the one that's going to shock most of you. You probably never even considered this. I don't think there's a single person on the internet that's ever looked at this possibility. Revelation 6, 5, and when he had opened the third seal, and I heard the third beast say, Come and see, and behold, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny, and see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Practically every single person I've ever seen do the horse rider here, and this is why you don't see that I, I don't have the famine horse rider guy uh, riding around. I think I do use it somewhere in this broadcast here because of the scales in his hand, but everybody considers it famine. It could have that meaning as well. I don't throw that out. There's, it can be compound fulfillment here, but I found something very startling and what this really represents. And you're about to find that out yourself. Let's take a look at it. Let's break it down. And I heard the, first, the third beast say, Come and see, and I beheld in lo a black horse. By the way, the third beast happens to be the, the face of a man. Remember that. He's a cunning guy. Only animal that's cunning is a human being. A black horse in ancient beliefs, by the way, is one of mystery, death, night, secret messenger of his hysteric knowledge. That's what a black horse actually represents 
in ancient times. They actually have that, whether it be a mystic type of belief or whatever, but I found it interesting that, he, that it rep, Black Horus represented mystery, it represents death, night, and secret messenger of esteric knowledge. In other words, if you want to know the secret knowledge, you got to be part of our group or you're not going to get it. Hmm. Maybe there's something about this horse guy here then. Let's look at something else it says here. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. Revelation 6, 5 again, and you see this is where they show it like famine. They, uh, people believe it's famine. But you see this other picture here? This just so happens to be Yeshua beating out the money changers out of the temple. And I looked for a picture because I knew there, I'd seen one before. And you see the scales, the balances over here? The money falling on, the money changers? Yeah, they use scales as well. See, that's how they did their dealings in the temple. So keep that really close in your mind there. I want to share something else with you, right? Now this is what it says about that scripture. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he drove them all out of the temple, and the sheep and the oxen, and poured out the changers of money and overthrew the tables. That was in John chapter 2, verse 15. Again, I blew up the picture so you can see here that balance that was used to weigh out the money there, okay? Now, if you look in Micah chapter 6, if you get a Bible, grab it and go pull it out because you're going to want to see this all. Verse 11, Shall I count them pure with the wicked balances and with the bag of deceitful weights? What did that horse rider have in his hand? A balance. Notice though, it was not the third beast that says a measure of wheat for a penny and a measure, three measures of barley for a penny, but it's the voice from in the midst of the beast. I think God is calling their hand on something. And I think Micah carries the key to what's going on in this. Let's take again another look here. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. Revelation 6.6. 6. Okay? Now, let's look at something else at Micah. Chapter 6, verse 14. Drop down three verses. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee. And thou shalt take hold, but shall not deliver. And that which thou deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint thee with oil and sweet wine, shall not th and shalt not drink, and thou shalt not drink wine. See that you hurt not the oil and wine. Maybe it's that they're not even going to get to touch the oil and the wine. All right, let me get to the point here of what we're talking about, guys, to make sense of this all. Does the Bible say anything about a black pope in relation to the end times? Now, the guy here that writes this article, gotquestions.org, and that's not the picture I use, the picture here of Pope Francis here before he becomes the Pope of Rome in his all black attire because why? He is a Jesuit, and therefore he wears all black. In fact, uh, as we read in here, St. Malachi in the 12th century at approximately A.D. 1139 received a vision in which it was revealed to him that there would be 112 popes, right? 112 more, with the last one being a black pope. Interestingly, the current pope, Francis, uh, is pope number 112. After St. Malachi's vision, although the court of popes varies somewhat, some see the connection between Pope Francis I and the color black due to Francis I uh, being a Jesuit, and Jesuits traditionally wearing black cassocks. So is Pope Francis I, the 112th pope, going to be the black pope? Well, the question could be, is he really the last pope, or is there still yet another one to come? Could be. I don't leave anything out. But nonetheless, the fact that he is a Jesuit, which would make him a black pope, sitting on the throne as a white pope there, has a lot to do with the fact of being the black horse rider. And he that sits on that horse, by the way, is called what? Death. 
All right. So death, anything anti-true Christ is death. Is that not right? Let's go on with this. Let's look at this a little bit deeper, guys. The Pope enters the gates. Now, this is not Pope Francis. This is Pope Benedict, still the, on the papacy throne. So technically, Pope Francis is only serving the seat of Pope 111. He's not really the 112th Pope. That's another reason why I say there's a possibility that another Pope will come. What if he doesn't die? What if Francis dies before Benedict does? And there's still yet another Pope to come. But still, what's going on in the background still plays out for the black horse rider. Let's take a look. So, Pope Benedict enters the gates of the Dome of the Rock on the 12th of May, 2009. Only his throne is now missing on the location of the Temple Mount. That's what some people really believe. And I agree. He wants to have his throne there. Israel already gave him an official seat at King David's tomb, and of course the first guy to wear his crown there was Pope Francis, to me, showing that he is the king. Okay? He's claiming to be the king of Israel, or in this case, the king of the north. Another interesting thought to look at. In April 2009, the Vatican signed the necessary agreement with the Arab League. On, tw on the 12th of May 2009, the Pope walked on the Temple Mount together with the Grand Mopti of Jerusalem, only two major persons were missing, the chief rabbis of the Jewish population. Because they have two chief rabbis. Chief uh, Rabbi Lau happens to be one of those chief rabbis. Now here's what's interesting. They're trying to get it to where they can build the third temple. And now you got Adnan and Akhtar in Turkey all excited about building the third temple. He is the Muslim counterpart helping to bring this about. He works with the rabbis of Israel, including Rabbi Yehuda Glick. It's a shame that Rabbi Glick went to the man, but nonetheless, he's working. Rabbi Glick wants to see the building of the third temple, okay? So the black pope, the whole, the whole thing about the black horse rider, guys, is the building of the third temple. Let me share with you more so you'll understand why I say this. It gets deeper, okay? Orthodox rabbis issued groundbreaking statement on Christianity. This was on Vatican Radio, right? Because what did they say was missing? The two chief rabbis. Now the rabbis have smoothed out the issues with the Pope of Rome. To make the peace plan for the UN, EU, the Quartet, the Pope, and Arab League a reality, the Zionists must come on board. Only when the Zionists are willing to surrender, the Pope can preside over a new neutral administration with its power seat on the exact spot where God's temple once was located. It had to come quite obvious that it is only a Christian Zionist and religious Jewish Judaism that hold back the last man of lawlessness from taking the stage in Jerusalem. That was on the website called the Vatican World Order .blogspot.cz here in the Czech Republic. Now these are part of the rabbis here from the... Uh, the, the uh, it is the Jewish Congress, not the Knesset, that are, that are in favor of the Nostri Aetate that signed the agreement with Rome. So they're working rapidly for what? The building of the third temple. Now, let's look at what I'm going here with this. Why do I say the black horse rider has anything to do with the third temple? All right? I justify the black horse because of what? So I don't lose you. Because we have a black pope, a Jesuit pope that is now a pope, first time in the papacy history. So the black horse, the power in this case here that he's riding, is the Jesuit power. Now the Jesuit power, because the Jesuits are a secret service of their own right. They're a military of their own right. And death is riding it. We're going to get into all those things in just a moment here. All right, let's first take a look though at Micah. Let's look at verses 2 all the way through 16, and it'll bring it together for you why I see the black horse rider here. Hear you, O mountains of the Lord's controversy, and you strong foundations of the earth, for the Lord hath the controversy with his people, and he will plead with Israel. He's, got, he's a little irritated right now with Israel. O my people, what have I done unto thee? And wherein have I wearied you? Testify against me. In other words, he's brought you back home. You're in your homeland. What has he done that has upset you? Excuse me. 
For I brought thee out of the land of Egypt and redeemed thee out of the house of servants, and I sent before thee Moses, Aaron, and Miriam. So for those of you guys that don't think that women, that God looks down on women, well, he includes Miriam in this. O oh, my people, remember now what Balak king of Moab consulted and what Balaam the son of Beor answered him from Shedem unto Gilgal, that you may know the righteousness of the Lord. Wherewith shall I come before the Lord and bow myself before the high God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings and calves of a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams or with tens of thousands of rivers of oil? Shall I give my firstborn from, for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He hath showed me, O man, what is good, and what doth the Lord require of you, but to do justly, and to love mercy, and walk humbly with your God. Okay, Israel, this is what God is wanting out of you. He's not worried about your third temple. He's not worried about you offering sacrifices. Do you not think that the sacrifice of Yeshua was enough? Okay? God's trying to get a point to you. Let's look at what he says. Verse 9, The Lord's voice crieth unto the city, and the man of wisdom shall see thy name. Hear ye the rod, and who hath appointed it? Are there yet the treasures of wickedness in the house of the wicked, and the scant measure that is abominable? Shall I count them pure with wicked balances, and with the bag of deceitful weights? Remember the horse rider? He's got that balance in his hand. For the rich men thereof are full of violence, and the inhabitants thereof have spoken lies, and their tongue is deceitful in their mouth. Why? Because he knows what all those horse riders have done. Therefore also will I make thee sick in smiting thee, and making thee desolate because of thy sins. Thou shalt eat, but not be satisfied. And thy casting down shall be in the midst of thee, and thou shalt take hold, but shalt not deliver. And that which thou deliver, deliverest will I give up to the sword. Thou shalt sow, but thou shalt not reap. Thou shalt tread the olives, but thou shalt not anoint with oil and with sweet, sweet wine, but shalt not drink wine. See the sowing? Remember Israel, they have the two harvests, the barley harvest and the wheat harvest. See, everything about that, the measure of wheat and the measure of barley. But notice the voice says, one measure of wheat, they get it for a penny. Three measures of barley, they get for a penny. Again, it's deceitful. And it's speaking about the feast days. It's speaking about the building of the third temple. Why does he bring up the wicked balances? Because he's talking about the sacrificial system. And what is Israel trying to do? Reinstitute institute the temple services. God wants a third temple, but it will not be built with hands. You, my friend, are that temple. God says, a body hast thou made. Christ was the temple, and he's wanting to reside in your temple. Isn't it interesting that when Moses had a temple, it was made of skins? That was telling you something, wasn't it? That the Most High dwelleth not in temples made with hands of stone, but in a temple made of skins. All right? So what is the, get the balance? That black horse rider is the Pope of Rome, the black pope. He is riding. He's got a balance in his hand. He's wanting to get the third temple set up. But there again, he's reminding you of Micah. We already went through this. I was not satisfied with your sacrifices. I didn't need them. And he brings up the fact about your crooked scales. And here, what does he do? He's got a scale in his hand riding into Jerusalem to show you, yes, I'll help you set up the temple sacrifices all over again, Israel. You need a little bit of gold for your wheat and for your barley? Well, he'll cheat you on that. Don't worry. As the old saying goes in Alabama, he'll cheat you like family. You're being duped by the black horse rider. Hurt not the oil and the wine. God's not going to even let you touch it. That's, that's your 
black horse rider, guys. Zechariah 12, 1, The burden of the word of the Lord for Israel, saith the Lord, which stretcheth forth the heavens and layeth the foundation of the earth, and formeth the spirit of man within him. Behold, I will make Jerusalem a cup of trembling. And to all the people round about when they shall be in siege both against Judah and against Jerusalem. And in that day will I make Jerusalem a burdensome stone for all the people. All that burden themselves with it shall be cut in pieces, though the people of the earth be gathered against it. In that day, saith the Lord, I will smite every what? Horse with astonishment and his what? Rider with madness. Oh. Maybe that black horse rider does have something to do with the third temple. Because they happen to come into Israel, don't they? It's only one rider though, right? And notice it was death. Death was on there. Right? Hmm. I'm sorry. That's, that's the uh, pale horse rider. We're going into that next. I kept saying that. I apologize. Death, I think, is on the pale horse rider. I should stick with my notes, guys. It'd be easier. So, all right, let's move right along. Pale horse riders next. Revelation 6, 8. And I looked and behold a pale horse and his name that sat on him was death. There it is. My apology. And hell followed with him. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth. Now, here's what's going to blow you away. I, have, I did notice on the internet, there are people that have re recognized that yes, Islam is everything to do with this pale horse. Let's first establish what's going on with the color of this here, all right? It says right here, this here is the Greek word, the Koine Greek word, it's called chloros. This is where we get the green or yellowish, as they say, pale for that horse. Some people say it's was well, mixed of all the colors. No, actually chlorus is where you get chlorophyll. Chlorophyll that makes the grass green, right? This is where the word comes from. He's not mixed colored. He is only a green horse, all right? Now, here's what's interesting as well. If you look at uh, the scripture here uh, in Mark chapter 6, verse 39, and he commanded them to make all sit down by the companies upon the, what? The chlora grass the green grass. All right, so the horse is a green horse that they come riding in on. So let's first set the pale horse right to note that it's really a green horse. And behold, a chlorus, a pale or a green horse, and his name that sat on him was death and hell followed with him. Revelation 6, 8. I think they did a good job on the picture of that horse right there, right? Now, here we get the green part of it. Islamic Greenwashing. Why is the color green so important in the Muslim world? The main rival of President Mah Mahmoud Ahmadinejad in the Iranian elections, Mr. Hosseini Mousavi, has adopted green as a signature color. The flags of Iran, Saudi Arabia, and the Palestinian group Hamas also include the color. Why is green so prevalent in the Muslim world? Because it was supposedly Muhammad's favorite color. The Islamic prophet is said to have worn a green cloak and a turban, and the writings are full of references of the color. A passage from the Quran describes paradise as a place where the people will wear green garments of fine silk. One hadith or teaching saying, when Allah's apostle died, he was covered with a, a hibra bird, which is green square garment as a result. That's interesting, isn't it? As we can see all the green flags. And believe me, look up. This is on the Temple Mount. They had all these green flags up there. But what's it got to do about the Vatican riding this horse? Well, let's take a look at it. Now, and behold, a chlorus pale green horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, or Hades, the grave. Well, look who else is cloaked in green. What do you know? You guys missed the whole big thing about the Pope and Islam and we're all the same and we serve the same God and Allah is the same God as the God of the Catholic Church. Well, he probably is. He's the God of death. And he's riding on a pale horse, a green horse. And as I have right here for you, this is at the Catholic Church here in the Czech Republic where it's all the bones. It's called the Bone Church. And in every 
Catholic Church throughout Rome here, every altar sits on a crypt or a huge pile of bones underneath every altar. So when they say that death sat on him, you can count on one thing. The Pope of Rome is riding Islam. And I wouldn't have a single bit of doubt in the world that his climate change policy is also his green initiative that goes along with his green horse riding days. Now, let's notice what else it says about him. Hell follows with him or the grave. Yes, everywhere he goes, death goes with him, as you see in the photograph. All right. And power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. Now that's death, of course, and the grave. Well, also the grave comes from the fact that Islam is slaying everything with the sword. They're killing everything and anything in their path. And of course, over the fourth part of the earth. Now I forgot to put this picture in here, but you know, in ancient times, before the Americas were discovered, the earth was divided into three parts. They actually have an ancient map that divides the earth into the Europe section, the Asian section, and the African section. That was called the three parts of the earth. So my question is, is the fourth part of the earth the Americas? Hmm. Given unto them was power. Well, what do you know? The United States has given the Pope power. What do you know? Power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth. Revelation 6, 8. Retired four-star U.S. Navy Admiral James A. Ace Lyons was recently at a national press club and his claims are shocking. It appears that Obama regime has been fully infiltrated by the Muslim Brotherhood terrorism front group on every level. And that pro-radical Islam group is also in every level of the U.S. Secretary uh, Security Agencies. Lyons went on to say that the transformation of America has been in full swing ever since 2008, when Obama campaigned on a platform of fundamentally transform America. Obama has done exactly that. It's given power. They both remember death. Hades, the graves, hell follows with him. And they're all in one accord. They all love each other. No wonder why. They've taken over the fourth part of the earth, Americas. Pope Francis to followers. Koran and the Holy Bible are the same. On Monday, the Bishop of Rome addressed Catholic followers regarding the dire importance of exhibiting religious tolerance during his hour-long speech. And smiling, Pope Francis was quoted telling the Vatican's guests that the Koran and the spiritual teachings of the, that contained therein are just as valid as the Holy Bible. Jesus Christ, Jehovah, Allah, these are all names employed to describe the entity that is distinctly the same across the world. For centuries, blood has been needlessly shed because of the desire to segregate our faiths. Well, it's because he's trying to kill off all the Eastern Orthodox. You don't believe me? This picture right here, Coptic Christian. No, I think this one's a journalist. I take that back. Remember the picture where you have all the guys lined up in the orange suits there? They were Coptic Christians. They were not Catholic, Roman Catholic. They were Eastern Orthodox. Pope don't care about them. I think this guy here was a journalist, if I remember right. It says what? To kill with a sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the earth, Revelation 6, 8. That's the one that got me, the beast of the earth. I'm like, what in the world does it mean about the beast of the earth? Well, let's take a look at the Greek then. What do you know? Strong's G, 2342. It just so happens it's an animal or a wild animal, wild beast, or it can also mean metaphorically a brutal, bestial man, a savage, a ferocious animal. Ring a bell? I could have vomited at the pictures I went through today to try to find you one that was not so horrid. With sword, they decapitate, they murder, they are savage. The ISIS group. And remember, who created ISIS? What did, what did Vladimir Putin, the guy that everybody's turning against, what did he say? United States created ISIS. The Obama administration, not the good American people, the Obama administration who has given power to all of Islam created ISIS. 
Now, let me give you a scripture to remind you of something here. To kill with sword and with hunger and with death and with the beast of the field or the savages. Savage, beastly men. See? Revelation 6, 8. Remember that scripture, Genesis 16, 11? And the angel of the Lord said unto her, Behold, thou art with child and shalt bear a son and shall call his name Ishmael. And because the Lord hath heard thy affliction, and he will be a wild man. His hand will be against every man, and every man's hand against him, and he shall dwell in the presence of all his brethren. Speaking of Israel, that shows that Israel would be right in the middle of all of them. Psalm 83, a song of Psalm of Asaph, Keep not thou silence, O God, hold not thy peace, and be not still, O God. For lo, the enemies... Make a tumult, and they that hate thee have lifted up the head. They have taken crafty counsel against thy people and consulted against thy hidden ones. They have said, Come, let us cut them off from being a nation, that the name of Israel may be no more in remembrance. For they have consulted together with one consent. They are confederate against thee. The tabernacles of Edom, the Ishmaelites, Moab and the Hagarines, the wild man, the savage man, of the green horse rider, the pale horse. Exodus 15, 1, though, what did God say? Then sang Moses and the children of Israel this song unto the Lord, and spake, saying, I will sing unto the Lord, for he hath triumphed gloriously over the horse and his rider, and hath thrown, he, he, and, excuse me, hath he thrown into the sea. Moses will return with Elijah, and finally, he will throw that horse rider into the sea, a sea of fire burning. I'm Stephen Benoon. You're watching Israeli News Live. Prophetic segment of our broadcast this evening. Don't forget, if you would, remember us in your giving. We definitely need your help to keep this broadcast going. And thank you and God bless you for your kindness. Shalom. Thank you.